Yeah. Do you have the slides? Do I have the slides? I just click uh, take control. Okay. There you go. Hello. We are doing various cases. Ignore the airway. Right. Uh, actually, no, don't ignore the airway. We're starting with the airway. This, uh, I've just thrown a couple of these in here because it's helpful to get a general understanding of the geography of, kind of where everything is. Plus, um, it helps understand some of the pathology that we will be covering later on. So, I mean, you can turn your uh, mics on if you want, but I know people are just going to hit it in the chat. Can you give me the answers from the top down, the kind of blanked out yeah. anatomical structures? So, should we start with the top left? Yes. Correct. And the next one down on the left. Yep. Absolutely. And the top from the right. Considering what it's uh, an extension of. Well, almost. So the uvula is the, is the last part of that soft palate. OK. Or thanks, no one cares about, so I've just left that. What's below that? Someone said epiglottis. Nope. It's the tonsils. But I mean, it's kind of difficult to see in a, in a transverse section like this, because they're off to the sides. Uh, and then, oh, epiglottis, you've got what else makes up the, uh, the bone part. What else is part of the larynx? You don't have to give them an order. You can just get to yeah, get just any. The it's fine. <laughs> mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah. And what final thing pointing at? You can feel it up on yourself if you palpate <laughs> carefully. Yeah. Oh no! Which one is it? Which one which is one it? Is yeah. It? yeah. <laughs> Which one is uh, the higher one? That this is pointing at. I need to stop just palpating my neck. That's weird. <laughs> just like testing it. It's fine. Yeah. We, we can hit neck. It's the uh, thyroid. The pricoid is the one slightly above, uh, below that, sorry. OK. Cool. Uh, next. OK, now this is uh, this. Usually, um, in terms of uh, anesthetics, this isn't the view you'd be seeing. You'd be seeing it kind of upside down, because when you put the the uh, kind of guide in with the little camera on the end, it means that just you view it the other way around, so the tongue is towards you. But this is just kind of an anatomical drawing of it. Uh, so going from the top. Anke, are you there? Hello? Uh, I, I think your internet can cut out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Amazing. Okay, mm. yeah. Well, no, I'm just going to give that to you. That doesn't really matter so much. It's just the base of the tongue. Yeah. But, yeah. Wait, that gave all of it, didn't it? Oh, well. You gave all of them. It's fine. It doesn't matter. Okay. So the epiglottis is uh, closer to the base of the tongue, so obviously it can uh, fold down to cover the airway, so food can come across it. Uh, the most important bits of this were the bits that I'd covered up, actually. So uh, the false vocal cords, which are on either side of the true vocal cords, and it's the gap in the middle that uh, causes phonation. And it's really interesting to see if you can see a video of uh, people talking, people singing, and if the, uh, of any uh, paralysis of the vocal cords, because you can see it like one side not moving while the other side is moving, or like it moving very little, or it moving too much, or stuff being trapped in there. So it's really interesting to see that, and it's useful as well. Uh, but fine, let's start with the case. We'll show you a video at the end if we have time. 
Sure, yeah. But um, just before we talk about the case, so that the anatomy on the previous slide is like can come up in SBAs. They can just give you a diagram and ask you to name bits of it. Like that's, that's a really important diagram. Pretty sure that happened. Yeah, in like second year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's likely to come up in clinical years as well because it's relevant um, anatomy. But yes, uh, the first case, you have a 10 year old boy comes into a &E with low grade fever, sore throat, dysphagia to solids for four days. His mother informs you that this is the fifth such presentation over the last few years, which has always previously been treated with antibiotics. OK. And no, oh, it's seen. OK, let's, let's, let's come up with differentials. I went to the next one. It just popped up. OK, differentials for uh, uh, this boy. So we're thinking fever, we're thinking sore throat, so tonsillitis would definitely be up there, correct? But what else? Strep throat, another important differential, very good. Especially considering the fever involved as well, yes. Yep. Infection, mononucleosis. Epiglottitis, correct. I'll go through some of the differentiating factors in it in a second, but let's just get all the as many differentials as you can get. Quincy is interesting. Um, Quincy can Quincy's can have so Quincy is a uh, uh, a retropharyngeal or a paratonsillar paratonsillar abscess. So basically, uh, you may get like it usually starts with tonsillitis in terms of actual cases or SBA land, but they can happen by themselves as well. Uh, infection of tonsils and it kind of spreads beyond that. Uh, and it becomes an abscess around there. Uh, its main kind of problem, other than the fever side, is the kind of mass effect of it shutting off the airway, which can be uh, really bad. Um, any other differentials? But we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. No. What would be the commonest in our age group, opposed to a 10 year old? What would what would be a common cause? Yes, glandular fever, very important. Um, and which virus is like the headline <laughs> one for <laughs> glandular fever? Oh, Vikram already said infectious mononucleus. Yeah, 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 yeah. EBV. So I think like remember that glandular fever is a presentation uh, caused by a number of different infections. And EBV is the most common cause of a glandular fever. Yeah. Shall we move on? Yes. Okay. So, oh, uh, going forwards. Okay, so here, kind of dark. Okay, well, here are the, click the differentials. What? Oh, click them. Click. They, they oh, I see. They do show up. Amazing. Wonders of technology. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, so I've put some uh, general points here because they kind of I didn't want to go into all of the details of everything that can cause an upper respiratory tract infection. But yes, it's a very general point. But I've put some specific um, differentials in there that are important to remember. Uh, so tonsillitis, as we mentioned, infectious mon mononucleosis, slash magic fever, lymphoma, lymphoma can as well, um, especially through the, uh, the, the mass effect uh, route that we were talking about with the Quincy's, which is uh, the abscesses on the other side. Epiglottitis, what's the what's the major cause of epiglottitis and the other kind of differentiating sign that you would see with that? Has a little bit of a crossover with PEDS next year. So not group A stress. No, but yeah, good guess. Uh, group A oh. strep commonly causes sore throats, but yeah, so yeah. that's a good idea. Uh, epiglottitis the, in, in, in an SBA, they may usually they would usually tell you that the the patient's uh, vaccine history is unclear, which is why Haemophilus influenza is uh, the answer to that. And uh, the sign, what would you see with epiglottitis in a child? Like the, the one thing that should set like alarm bells ringing in your head, other than the kind of airway symptoms that we've talked about in the fever. So, 
so what one thing in an SBA are you looking for pretty much? No, stridor can be caused by a couple of things. Uh, this person could have stridor, for example. Lots of these things could cause stridor. Yeah, good thought though, yeah. Mm -hmm. So dysphagia, again, if you have uh, any sort of infection of the respiratory tract, um, upper respiratory tract, it's so close to um, the digestive tract that it can cause pain on uh, uh, eating and that therefore cause problems um, with swallowing. So lots of these could cause dysphagia as well. Plus the mass. Yeah, well. yeah um, good idea again. The, may, uh, the, may, the, the thing I'm trying to get at is uh, the drooling. So epiglottitis can cause uh, quite significant drooling in uh, children. Um, usually it is children that are uh, uh, affected by this. And so that's, that's what I was getting. Oh, um, anything else to talk about here? Uh, yeah, no. uh, just one thing. Epiglottitis is super rare now. Like, mm. like Because of the vaccine, it is. Because of the vaccine. Like, super rare, but very important to know about. Okay, and uh, yeah, I've, I've put Lemiere's there just because it's a rare thing that they could does, bring up. Does anyone know what Lemiere's is while we're talking about it? It's something you should read up on, but it's almost purely it's not, academic. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a lot of things like that. Yeah. Anyone know what Lemiere's syndrome is? Or what bacteria causes it? You can, you can have either. I'd be surprised if they got the bacteria. I'd, either way, I'd be surprised. So Lemier's so yep, syndrome is a really, really rare um, infection which causes thrombophlebitis of the, in, uh, the internal jugular vein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be a complication of tonsillitis, but it's a specific right. bacteria um, caused, uh, called Fusobacterium necroforum. That's mm -hmm. all you really need to know about it. <laughs> like... Th yeah, there's like exactly. one line exactly so i mean just like adding to that line not to make it too long it's just uh tonsillitis uh the thrombophlebitis plus you can get septic emboli caused by the thrombophlebitis which can go to like lungs and brain and whatever it's a bad news and uh yeah the the bacteria that it's caused by because it's pretty you know that bacteria equals i mean yeah. it doesn't cause uh, yeah exactly cool Next, uh, so just a little bit of addition to this history. Uh, no one in the family or at school has had similar symptoms. Mother gave the boy some paracetamol for the pain and the temperature earlier. Uh, he's not had a cough. He's ha he has some lymphadenopathy on examination. When you look inside his mouth, there's some purulent exudic seen on the tonsils, and his temperature is 38.3. What's the most likely cause of this out of the differentials we talked about? Correct, yeah. So I, I'd put tonsillitis as the top uh, for this as well. Okay. So I'm sure that you guys have covered central criteria. I'm pretty sure Noosh has actually been the one to cover that with you guys. Um, so for anyone that isn't aware, the central criteria is uh, a criteria that are used to judge the um, uh, likelihood of... <laughs> Have you not? I don't think I have. Well, you mentioned it. I think in yeah, one I think of the I previous ones, it. you mentioned like, oh, we've already done central criteria. We're doing it again. Um, no. But OK, central criteria is a set of criteria <laughs> that are used to judge the likelihood of the causative, uh, or the cause behind this being bacterial. So the more central, usually it's if, if you have a, a three of these five criteria kind of ticked off, then it makes it likely that it's a bacterial cause as opposed to the viral cause, which is the most common form of tonsillitis that you do see. Um, and the most common uh, bacteria, when we're talking about like, a bacterial cause of it, is a uh, group A strep. The reason I have the fever pain score up there is because in actual kind of clinical practice, um, people have found that the fever pain score is more accurate, it's more predictive, of uh, a bacterial infection. In the I mean, so that you can understand the importance, right? The, the kind of uh, management are completely different with a viral versus a bacterial 
uh, tonsillitis and the bacterial has far more serious complications and it can make the child far sicker, it can compromise the airway, whereas the viral one is far less likely to do that. So it's important that we kind of work out, you know, which one is which. Um, but yeah, I put the fever pain score up there because you may hear about it and um, it's kind of coming into use more and more and it's generally held as kind of a better version of Sentinel. Sentinel. Things are quite similar um, anyway, but yeah, I just have that in as a little addition. Do you want to say anything about that? Mm, I do not. Scores are boring. A bit correct. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, the investigations. That's uh, well, I've already done it now. Uh, but let's go back anyway. What investigations would you want to do? How would you want to go about uh, uh, treating this person? Would you do investigations first? Would you do some management first? Would you do a mixture? What investigations? That kind of stuff. Did five seconds to look at the answer before I took them away. <laughs> okay, correct. Bedside bloods. What would you see in them? Sure. So, so yeah. general infection markers, correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would help. Uh, what, what else? Sorry. So we've done the we've done the examination, and you've seen some uh, polyant exudate. Do you want to do anything with that? Yeah, that'd be that'd be a good shout as well. Uh, so it's important to take a swab of the throat, and that can help you uh, verify if it is a bacterium, which bacterium is causing it. Okay. So this is some other stuff that I've just put in there. So the throat culture, uh, the important point about that is that you don't need to do the throat culture before you treat. It's more important to treat this uh, patient than it is to kind of work out what the bacteria was, because either way, um, it's going to be antibiotics. And it's uh, at the beginning, it's unlikely to be a bacterium that uh, your initial kind of management wouldn't uh, do, uh, wouldn't be able to treat. So the blood cultures are interesting. Um, it depends, I guess, on the severity of the illness. If they've come in with the kind of symptoms we've talked about where, you know, you're worried, but it's not a septic picture or a shock picture, then I would probably go first along uh, the lines of treating them and just doing the uh, throat swab. Uh, unfortunately, this throat swab is not very, um, uh, is not very sensitive. So blood cultures would be more sensitive done that but again the the reason for the blood culture would be just to find out what is growing essentially and if you've seen the exudate it fits the central or the fever pain criteria it's likely to be bacterial you whack them with antibiotics essentially um some of the other causes uh for the infection so uh you can do the uh you can do a viral load for hiv if there's any kind of history or any sign of that. You can do uh, genital swabs for a gonococcal cause of the tonsillitis, um, which can happen as well. And uh, I guess if you wanted to confirm that it was group A strep, you could do the rap rapid uh, strep antigen test. Uh, it's way faster than a culture, which takes a couple of days, but it's again, not very sensitive. So uh, people tend people tend not to do, can you see my mouse? I don't know if you can see it. No. <laughs> People tend not to do the, the top two because, again, it doesn't really uh, inform management so much. Uh, so how would you manage um, this tonsillitis then? Let's assume it's bacterial. Yes, C going on from this patient. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, correct. What would you do before that? Oh, <laughs> well, go back. Fine, I didn't see anything. It's fine. <laughs> As in, you you will you'll start. Yeah, you yeah you want to check allergies because remember in kids like they've likely never taken antibiotics before, but if they have, you want to find out whether they're pen allergic or not. So yeah, mm -hmm. do check what, antibiotics. What, what do you give in a pen allergy? So penicillin V is correct. What do you give in pen allergy? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. a rhythmized thing, rhythmized thing, they're all fine. Exactly. Fine. Uh, what do you... So say they have tonsillitis. Um, uh, you know it's bacterial. You don't know... Uh, sorry, you don't know it's bacterial. It's just had tonsillitis. And you want to give them... Yeah, that, that's what I was going to ask. Why would you not give them amoxicillin on uh, a tonsillitis that you're kind of unsure about the origins of or unsure whether it's viral or bacterial? James stole your fire. It's fine. Don't worry Do you about want to explain? it. James knows his stuff. You can... You, oh, wait. He's already... Uh, yeah, no, actually, no. I just read his answer as well. Amazing. Yes, that's why. Uh, amoxicillin can uh, be the cause of a reaction which causes a a macular papular rash if the cause is EBV, essentially. Which is why you avoid amoxicillin in like amoxicillin and if you don't know the cause in tonsillitis, you kind of don't want to go along the line of giving it. Um, but in this case, if they have uh, you know, a temperature and a cough, they have um, uh, exudate, then it's likely to be bacterial. So NV is fine. Uh, yes, often viral, so you conservatively group a strep. Um, don't forget that they're in pain. So check with the mother how much paracetamol she's already given, and then you can prescribe them paracetamol with that as well. Um, Diflam spray is a useful thing that you'll see in clinic. It's not really in the books, but it's, you know, quite, quite, quite often used in uh, clinical practice, which is just a kind of an anti-inflammatory spray like uh, pain relief uh, and penicillin V for 10 days usually is the, the course for tonsillitis and uh, erythromycin if they're allergy and you don't give them oxygen. Cool. Um, um, just one thing. So like the reason you don't really need to give them oxygen is pen V or phenoxamethyl penicillin, whatever you want to call it, was pretty much invented to like deal with strep. So like it's really good against strep, and most of most of the bacterial causes are strep. So like adding the broad spectrum amoxicillin doesn't actually like add any benefit over just using Penv. So like this is why you don't generally need to use amoxicillin. Some GPs like trusts do end up oh. using it. Oh, okay. Uh, could you oh. give the Diflam spray in viral? Um, yeah, you absolutely can give Diflam spray in viral. Again, it just uh, reduces the uh, inflammation. It's not really fighting the infection, so to speak. Cool. So, say uh, in the history, we talked about this being the fifth uh, time this has happened in the last two years. That's an important aspect of this history because it leads on to uh, tonsillectomy. The tonsillectomy is obviously going to be the final kind of definitive management of any recurrent tonsillitis. And this is a nice, helpful way of remembering when it's indicated. So the 753 rule, seven confirmed cases of uh, uh, sore throat over the last year, or five such episodes over the last two years, or three such episodes over the last three years. So just showing that it's recurrent and it's over time, essentially. Um, so that's just, yeah, that's a useful way of remembering when uh, tonsillectomy is indicated. Uh, obviously taking into account some clinical uh, judgment as well, etc. Um, this is, That's interesting. I don't think so. I think it needs, from my understanding of it, I think it needs to be confirmed um, cases. So they, they it needs to have gone to hospital and they need to have kind of a diagnosis for it. But I don't think it needs to be uh, bacterial specifically to have the tonsillectomy. Yeah, I don't think it does either because like, yeah. uh, like you can rule, uh, like you can ruin a child's like childhood or adolescence by not giving them a tonsillectomy. Like people can have awful quality, uh, quality of life. Like it is actually a massive deal. All right, so I'd say, yeah, that's the case. Um, uh, three, each for a year or three uh, three years or three in total. Uh, so this is three in total. So three in the last three years, five in the last two years, or seven in the last year. Yeah, it's just to show its uh, progression over time. Yeah, it's to manage waiting lists more than anything. 
like let's be realistic <laughs> okay so oh yeah so tom select me um probably the first major operation that many children go on undergo uh complications from it You can spout your usual like BS for this. There should there should be some BS. There should always and I know Anush hates the BS answers, which are always correct. Correct. I, I love them actually. Nausea and vomiting for every drug ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's free marks. Yeah. <laughs> Pain bleeding infection. Correct. Which one's the most important? Do you think specifically to this uh, uh, this surgery? Yes, bleeding. Bleeding is the most important. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about that. A little bit. Uh, pain, we've talked about pain can actually increase after the surgery for up to six days. Uh, hemorrhage will come back to, oh, no, we won't come back to that. That is it. Um, oh, and infection and uh, bleeding are the other two major ones. Um, you can also have uh, another one to remember in your kind of BS answers is ineffective surgery or like if you're removing something you fail to remove all of it uh, you may cause trauma to the area causing other problems um because that's quite a sensitive area you could cause you could like mess with the lymph system and cause a lymphedema you could mess with the airway system uh, you could mess with the digestive system cause a perforations trauma etc so it's always good to have that as a, as a as a bs answer in there as well but yes hemorrhage is the most important Hemorrhage is split up into two. You get primary hemorrhage. Um, uh, yeah, you get primary hemorrhage over the first uh, six to eight hours. If that happens, you take them straight back to surgery because what are the. Oh, wait, I've that again. Ugh. Ugh, why am I an idiot? Okay. Primary hemorrhage, the major reason is probably because of uh, trauma to the air, uh, site or dehiscence of uh, the tissue there. So it's kind of come apart or it's bleeding again because you've nicked something or done something, which is why it's really important for them to return back to surgery. Secondary hemorrhage, five to 10 days afterwards, they don't need to go back to surgery. It's usually due to infection. Um, therefore, that's kind of treated in the way infections are treated with you know, antibiotics. Um, depending on the severity of the bleeding, because that's what you would treat acutely, um, it's usually tranexamic acid, one gram, Stat, you can give uh, one in 10,000, 10, one in 10,000 adrenaline. Uh, is it 10,000? Hang on. It is 10,000. Just check it. Uh, you don't want to give the wrong one. This is why it's always good to check. Uh, one in 10,000 adrenaline, so gauze, you can put it in the area. And again, with the adrenaline, it just causes a basic constriction that makes the bleeding uh, slow, makes uh, clotting likely because of that. Because uh, of slower blood flow through there, and you can get hydrogen peroxide uh, gargles, which are also useful. Okay. Um, just a useful OSCE tip, even though I know you don't have an OSCE. Uh, you keep you saying about... this. I know because, like, you they they will have an OSCE at some point. Um, any compl complications if you're asked about, split them into early and late. Um, it's a good way of remembering them, and it makes you sound slick, so you get free marks. Um, yes. Here we go. Compl oh, I did this one right. doesn't show immediately. Complications of pompolitis. Oh, thank you. I didn't <laughs> do it right. I just made it look pathetic. <laughs> so we've talked about a few already. Quincy, correct. Anything else you can think of? What else is in that area of your body? Post-drop post -drop complications, yes, but we, they're not on this slide, but they are. We can, we'll talk about that briefly. What else? Dig deep. What are ENT surgeons worried about? What else? Vocal cord damage. I guess that's... Uh... That is possible. I think it's more likely during surgery than it is as a direct complication of the tonsillitis. Yeah. But it, it's definitely a possibility as well. 
It charges media? Yes. Media's an item. I mean, you could, but like, yeah. again, if it, that's more likely if it's like a um, piece of bacterium cause. But yeah, it'd have to be really bad to get media stonitis. Okay. Uh, Should I bring yeah. it up? Yeah, go on. Okay. We have a Titus Media, correct? Uh, as we can talk a little bit about, uh, that's just because there's a connection between uh, the oropharynx and the, the middle ear. And um, it's actually a, a really important uh, sign of um, nasopharyngeal cancers as well. So if you have a, a cancer in the area of kind of your nasopharynx or oropharynx, if you have a patient that comes in with kind of otitis media type um, symptoms or some sort, of, some sort of tinnitus or tinnitus, or something like that, uh, some hearing loss, that can also kind of be a sign of uh, the cancer in the oropharynx and the nasopharynx. So that's important to remember. That's something I learned actually fairly recently. Um, Quincy's, peritonsal tonsil abscesses. That's kind of the major complication, the headline complication of tonsillitis. Uh, the way you would recognize it, um, um, just quickly, everyone know what trismus is. I'm not gonna wait for an answer. Trismus is based. <laughs> I just wait for a bunch of no's. <laughs> yes, it's it's locked jaw essentially. Correct. It's uh it's uh when your mandible um the muscles control your mandible lock, so it's difficult to open your mouth, it's difficult to eat, it's difficult to talk, essentially. Uh hot potato voice, it um that's just the kind of classic definition. You're unlikely to actually be given that. The medical medical school don't like giving you kind of these these descriptions that kind of straight point to one thing they might like to uh, describe it in a generic way and they make uh, they like uh, to make you think about it but hot potato voice is just describing a kind of slightly hoarse voice that sounds like uh, someone's just eating something really hot and they're like <sighs> and trying to breathe out like that to cool it down um, and when you look inside you would see the deviated uvula so that would be again away from the side of where the uh, peritonsal abscess is. And uh, retropharyngeal abscess, it's just further back. So the tonsillitis can go pretty much in any direction. Uh, peritonsillar means that it's on either side and it can cause um, closing off of the airways, uh, which is obviously something that you don't want to have. Um, the retropharyngeal abscess is usually treated by uh, incising and draining. Do you have any questions about the complication? I need you to say something. Uh, let's just talk about streptococcal complications. So, um, if the tonsillitis is due to strep, or if it's, or if you just have like a streptococcal sore throat, you don't treat that. The, the common complications you get are, are what? Like, there's there's two big ones. One of them's really rare. One of them's pretty common. I mean, not that common. <laughs> just more common than yeah. the rare one. So rheumatic mm -hmm. fever is so rare now. That is the that's that's the rare one. And yeah, you get yeah. post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, which is slightly more common. Absolutely, yeah. Always keep those two in mind. Uh, rheumatic uh, post so strep group A strep causes lots of weird antibody antigen interactions. So you get lots of immune mediated things going on. Um, it's like implicated potentially in the production of some autoimmune conditions as well, but like they don't really know yet. How long after the strep infection uh, do you get, the, the time period, do you get the glomerulonephritis in? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Two right. weeks. So which one is the one that it often gets confused with, which happens in a few days? And you will get this confused when you're revising. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. IGA nephropathy, yeah. Good. Good. Uh, and it's important that you don't get the two confused because um, it is quite confusing. Okay. Case two, fun. So, do we have any questions about uh, tonsillitis, ENT, stuff around that? If I you post you... in the chat, I'll try and answer as you go along. All right. Just for cool. the sake of time. Sure, we can carry on. Okay. 
Emily is a 20-year-old female who is brought into A&E by the ambulance after a sudden change, sudden changes to her conscious, her level of consciousness and difficulty speaking with friends at a party. Her friends called 999. She became agitated and incoherent. When you see her, she is conscious but confused, disorientated and unable to speak. Some of her friends uh, have arrived with her. Sounds like a lit party. What's going on? What could be going on? Oh, someone is very cynical. Drug overdose. It could be. It could very much be. It a could drug be. Overdose. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could be a hypo as well. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Could be. What else? I'm liking a bunch of these differentials that weren't on our slide. <laughs> yeah, I like it when people think outside the remit of whatever we're talking about. So yeah, it could it could be a bleed, it could be a seizure. There's a, there's a really 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 wide differential. She's basically yes. acutely unwell. Yes. And there's a yeah, that's kind of the reason I wanted to write this one in this way. Get something really general, and then I'll give you a bit more history, and then I'll ask you for a, a more specific. In the context of airways, what kind of stuff are you worried about with a rapid deterioration in health? Exactly. Uh, anaphylaxis, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. Can they see them? No, just cl click again. <laughs> uh, okay, so I can see them. <laughs> yeah, so this is just uh, again just. Uh, these aren't necessarily diagnoses. Anaphylaxis, uh, like shock sepsis, aren't. There, there are usually causes behind them. And you had a go at me for writing them down, but I just, again, couldn't be bothered to write all of the different causes for all of the different things. Um, because I knew I'd forget things, and you guys would obviously come up with uh, things that I wouldn't include. But yes, adding to your list, um, general sepsis shock. Uh, an asthma attacks and maybe not necessarily complete anaphylaxis, the reaction to something it could just be uh, asthma and if she's aspirated or something. That could also be the case. Um, anything essentially, yeah, <laughs> so annoying. Um, essentially anything that could cause a, a delirium could uh, be included as a, as a differential here as well. Okay. So a little bit further history. Our friends give a collateral, her symptoms started suddenly at the party, they remember her pointing to her neck. They heard her breathe. Her breathing was noisy, you can hear this. It's not changed. Too. Exactly. Uh, any other questions you would want to ask? Have you changed the slide? Yes, no, what? Oh, hang on. Here we go. Sorry, <laughs> apparently I stopped presenting. I just read all of that out. Yes. Any other questions you would want to ask? Any known analogies? Good. Correct. So, I mean, you wouldn't ask for that. You would look look at that. But yeah, I, <laughs> I get what you mean. Has this happened before? Again, good, good question. Yeah, well, good. what she's recently had to eat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a great question because uh, you were worried about diabetic stuff as well. So you like, mm -hmm. hit, hit two birds with one stone. Yeah, that's, that's another point. Let's, let's cover some of the, the, the previous um, differentials that you guys came up with as well. So you've kind of hit on hypos a little bit. What, what else would you want to ask to kind of con uh, cover those? Just to remind you, the... Differentials like drug overdose, hypo, DKA, seizure, bleed, meningitis, alcohol, sepsis, sweaty, nauseous, very good. Mm -hmm. Her friends are there as well, so I guess you could ask them if they've been taking any drugs. Mm. Very good. Any uh, uh, ill health before the party is uh, always important as well. And I guess the last point would be with seizures and the bleed. Any, uh, has anyone? Yep, fine. <laughs> Was she good with lights? <laughs> Was she good with lights or no? <laughs> yeah, that's, that, yeah. I'm sure that's exactly how you would ask that question in real life. The LSD hitting hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, contact tracing, question, very important. Yeah. yeah. 
the other thing, the other thing I would add would be, um, uh, did she have any kind of obvious local neurology, any uh, falls, anything like that, any obvious seizing or shaking uh, to kind of round out that differential question. Yeah, the other things I've just put on a little bit more to guide you towards this case, which is a symptom started near the snack table, as most symptoms do. Uh, they do not know if she has any allergies. They didn't bring her bag with her stuff. On examination, her lips are swollen and blue. You can hear a bilateral wheeze and you can hear stridor from the end of the bed. Her respiratory rate is 28. There's some crumbs on her jumper. There's a rash on her chest when you take a, when you uh, open her shirt. And uh, her blood pressure is 102 over 88. Sat's 95% on room air. What do you think? Correct. Anaphylaxis would definitely be the top uh, choice at this point. Talk a little bit about anaphylaxis. Uh, let's go back. Keep doing this. What what things can cause anaphylaxis? <laughs> what a mug. <laughs> I should have put more animations, but I'm sorry. These high dancers. Transfusions, okay. I love how you said something that you knew wasn't on the slides. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but I can, I mean, uh, blood transfusions, do you know what type of uh, uh, anaphylactic response they would be? So we're going, to go into, we're going to go into the types in a second. So <laughs> type one. Yeah. Um so let's do it. I think I, mean, I, I just talked through them, I think it's probably easier. Okay. Okay, okay. Let's, yeah. yeah, let's talk through them. Okay. Anaphylaxis is severe, potentially life threatening allergic reaction that occurs over minutes, which is important. Uh the mechanisms. So grossly it's divided into non immune long immunological and immunological. So the non-immunological ones are alcohol, exercise, opioids, um, and they can all cause uh, anaphylaxis. Uh, the immunological ones split into IgE-mediated and non-IgE-mediated. The IgE-mediated medi ones are the ones, you know, the classic ones that you think of with food, uh, you know, the classic venom that always comes up, um, drug allergies, especially uh, penicillin, that was, I think, someone mentioned uh, above, and allergies to things like latex or materials, etc. Um, non IgE mediated, kind of the important one in that is uh, the radio contrast. <laughs> um, but yes, the kind of uh, the way it works is you'll, in, in, in all of these, pretty much, is that you'll have a hypersensitization event on the first exposure to something. I'm, I'm specifically talking about the um, the IgE-mediated one here, because that forms IgE-mediated bodies, uh, antibodies, sorry, wow. Um, and then the second exposure, kind of later on, once you have this immune response kind of developed, would be antigen binding to the antibodies, causing the mast cell degranulation, and then causing this just cascade with uh, all these effects, like the, uh, the inflammation, the rash, etc. When non-immunological uh, and non-IgE mediated, what causes the anaphylaxis? Um, I'm not actually sure. Do you know, Anka? So I was having a look at this, and it, you know, it just, people keep talking about the IgE. They keep talking about the IgE, and they didn't talk about the non-IgE. So I can have a look at that for you, and I can bring that up um, in the group, or we can put it on the Facebook page afterwards. Yeah. Mast cells can get oh. triggered by other stuff. Interesting. Yeah. Um, if 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 they ask you what type of hypersensitivity reaction anaphylaxis is, though, remember IgE. always say type one IgE mediated, even though there are like these other subtypes. It's the most important one. It's the one you'll be seeing, and if it is anything else, it's not going to be your job to start off with. Okay. Next. Uh... How would we treat this? <laughs> oh my god, this is 
someone will still go into anaphylaxis on their first exposure. Not necessarily. So uh, the, uh, the anaphylactic kind of event happens because of the development of the hypersensitivity to the uh, initial whatever it is, the initial, initial exposure. Um, so it's kind of, I guess, uh, a good analogy for it would be if you think about, I mean, I was going to, Anish, I'm going to bring up like the Reese's D stuff, but I don't think that would be relevant. relevant. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> the, the majority of anaphylaxis is not a first exposure. Like if, if someone has anaphylaxis and they're like, this is, a, a, this is my first exposure, they probably had a first exposure and not realized it. Like that's what happens with most food things. Like first exposure anaphylaxis, uh, anaphylactic shock is actually quite rare. It's usually a, it's usually a second exposure. And it's really, really difficult to ascertain if something is the first exposure or not. Like how is yeah. you know an eight year old kid going to tell you if this is the first time they've had peanuts or not? Is it, yes, it is the same with penicillin. Yeah. So that would be in the drug allergy for the Ig mediated. Yeah. Okay. How would we treat anaphylaxis? Ah, oh, I love it when people with. give me doses. Yeah. One in a thousand. Really good. Good. Uh, anything else? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oxygen, elevate legs, bronchodilators, hydrocortisone, bronchodilators. I think uh, the bronchi on the bronchodilators point you would give if you hear the wheeze. So if there's a um, end airway inflammation causing like bronchospasm, then you would give bronchodilators. And in this case, we did hear bilateral wheeze, so you would give the bronchodilators. The other stuff you'd give for pretty much everyone. Fluids, yes, depending on the blood pressure which I think was low in this case. So you would get fluids. Uh, does treatment change if it is non-immunological versus immunological? No, because uh, this is kind of the acute management. So, I mean, I'll go to it. Uh, wait for control. Uh, 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 yes. So the first thing you want to do is uh, if their airways closing up, it means they can't auction. First problem. Airway is always the front of the doctor ABCD. So you want to make sure it's open so that the other things that you want to give can get in there. Intubate, yes, that would be a kind of a, a, a last line type thing. Um, so you would position the patient flat. You may want to raise their legs if you want. Uh, and you'd give IM 500 micrograms of adrenaline into the outer one third of the thigh. Um, a Goodell isn't intubating. A Goodell is an airway adjunct. So that stays above the larynx and it just kind of, uh, they can, you can uh, you use that to kind of increase the amount of oxygen or airflow that they are getting. But intubation is when you basically take over the entire upper respiratory tract function. Essentially, it gets sealed off. Um, a Goodell doesn't get sealed off. Uh, yes. Uh, adrenaline out of one third of the thigh. You can repeat this every five minutes, depending on the patient's response. Uh, it would be after this that you would be able to give the high flow oxygen. You can give nebulized adrenaline as well, if they have like a really severe stridor um, to kind of continue the uh, opening up of the airways again, fluids of hypotension. Uh, so you give this without kind of any investigations because at that point, you have the clinical diagnosis of anaphylaxis, you want to just get on with it and save their life. So that's going to be this step. After that, you may want to do some investigations or whatever once they've stabilized a little bit, and then there will be other treatments as well. So I'm not going to ask you. Whoa. Um, if you go back for a second. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh. Oh, those are in the wrong order. OK, so, the, so it's initial this. And then after that, it would, yeah, after that, you can do this stuff. So the antihistamine and the steroids you give after initial treatment. <laughs> Wrong order. Um, fine, yes. Uh, generally, the antihistamine 
making a choice to phenamine, but again, can vary. Steroids again can vary between hydrocortisone, prednisolone, whatever. Um, that's just for its anti-inflammatory effect there. Uh, importantly, sometimes the kind of onset of symptoms can be biphasic. So you really these patients they, they come in very sick, uh, and if they're admitted, you need to make sure that they are watched for at least the first twelve hours because they may improve with the adrenaline and the antihistamine and the steroids that you give them. But then afterwards, the, uh, it can, uh, the symptoms can come back, it can worsen. And if they're not regularly monitored, that can be very easily missed and uh, lead to very serious consequences. So you need, want to make sure that they are monitored uh, for at least the first 12 hours and that they're kept in for that long. So if you give someone um, uh, anaf- uh, uh, adrenaline and oxygen and antihistamines or whatever, and then they're fine in like two hours, I would not suggest sending them home. You want to watch them for that long to make sure the symptoms don't come back. Uh, and write that in your management plan. Yes. Because otherwise someone will discharge them and then they might die. Someone who doesn't, who didn't uh, have such an amazing presentation on anaphylaxis uh, won't know about this and they will discharge them and send them home. So make sure you put that in. Uh, additionally, you can prescribe them some extra antihistamines, steroids to take once they are released. Um, make sure they have an anaphylaxis plan. So if they're a child, for example, uh, make sure they have it, their parents have it, their school knows about it, like what to do in case of, uh, you know, anaphylaxis. Uh, make sure they have an EpiPen. So the reason I put in their history initially that they didn't bring her bag and her stuff is because you would have found an EpiPen in there and that would have kind of told you everything about it as well. Uh, make sure they have training, their parents, if they're a child, their parents have training anyone who may be responsible for them, and an allergy bracelet, especially if it's an anaphylaxis level reaction they have to whatever allergen it is. Um, Fine. And uh, just a standard thing that you want to put after any kind of hospital admission is organize a follow-up with Haji. Just always stick at it. Okay. Um, I have a question. So, you're... I'm allowing you to do one investigation for you to check whether this is a true anaphylaxis. <laughs> what investigation can you do? What Love single investigation confirms anaphylaxis? Serum tryptase, yeah. You don't How really do you use do it, it for anything else. Um, but yeah, you do that after an anaphylaxis type reaction. And if it's raised, then it's anaphylaxis. Right. Um, so. Important, quickly, just important part about the serum tryptase. Uh, it's on a delay, and you need uh, three samples to um, confirm a diagnosis of anaphylaxis with the serum tryptase. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, we can, to fun uh, things. We can either stop there, because I know it's like been like 55 minutes, or we can do the short case. So it's up to you. One more. Uh, yeah, go on, Vikram. Also, if I, uh, carry on. Okay, cool. I'll carry on. Why can the symptoms be biphasic? They initially improve on the uh, adrenaline and the chlorpheniramine, but the part of the reason. No, sorry to cut you off. Go on, finish what you're saying. The reaction just hasn't finished. The mast cell reaction is still continuing because exactly. that can last up to twelve hours. Exactly. So the so this is the reason that what you're treating and the management plan is the same for IgE mediated and non IgE mediated because you're not really dealing with the kind of immune response you're just dealing with the symptoms making sure that they live through it um the immune reaction carries on happening so if they get better you kind of reduce things down the immune reaction is still happening the symptoms can come back essentially three you need three three samples samples. yeah um fine so can someone tell me what they see here do not give me the medical name for it. I want to know the <laughs> past, what you see. <laughs> see. <laughs> you're, you're way too entertained by this. Uh, so what, so he's I, I, drooping eyelid on the left-hand side is one of the things that this patient has. What else? Also, what's the technical term for that? Because you're not going to say that in an OSCE. You could if you can think of the right name. I mean, yeah, if you can't think of it, say it. But yeah. So, ptosis. 
uh, pupil constricted on the left hand side meiosis. How, how do you know it's the pupil constricted on the left side? Just, I mean, in this in this picture, it's not it's not a medical thing. Well, it's true you don't, but I mean, I'm just talking about there's a light shining directly into the eyes. You can see it's uh, like from the reflection, it's straight on. So in this kind of scenario, you would want it to be um, you would want it to be constricted, right? So the fact that it's dilated on the right suggests that it might be a pathology there. That's the opposite of the case. No, I know. I'm just saying. Yeah, I, I would go along with the because the symptoms are on the same side. I would agree because there's a ptosis on the left and there's a fixed pupil on the left. So I, I, mean, I would look, go along you, with you that. You know what it you know what it is. That's why the symptoms yeah. go together. Mm. What one other finding would you find uh, would you could you expect on examination now given the most likely diagnosis? Can you see it? I don't you can't see it on this picture, but what one other finding need, would you look for? And hydrosis, absolutely. You need to go for a run. So, Horner syndrome, three is what this is called, for those of you that didn't know it, three big features. You get constriction of the pupil because the dilator papillae is supplied by sympathetic um, nerves. You get ptosis because the levator palpebrae superioris is supplied by sympathetic nerves and I hope I hope you know by now that sweating is like a fight or flight response. It happens when you're running around, of course. So those are your three headline features. Um, I think PassMed says there's like an ophthalmos as well, but like I don't really, I've never been told that by any neuro, neuro consultant, so I won't tell you that either. Um, so Horner syndrome is actually like a pretty important like thing to pick up on examination of any patient. So. How would you split up the causes of Horner's syndrome? I love splitting stuff up. I, I'm sure everyone has figured this out by now. It's just categorize everything. That's how you remember things in medicine. It also makes There's multiple answer. different ways of doing an, it. When you use that as an answer. So, yeah, I mean, you've started doing it uh, by surgical sieve. You could do that. You could you can always use the surgical sieve. But before we get to that. So, yeah, is it primary versus secondary? Is it congenital required is like the first step I like to take. So there is a specific sign with anyone who has, why did someone take control of the presentation? <laughs> Snakes everywhere. What, Fine, it gives them the answer. Right? If you have congenital, uh, congenital horners, you have one specific sign that you don't get with any of the acquired causes. Does, do any of you know what that is? Look at the iris is the clue. No one know? So you get a change in eye color, you get heterochromia, yeah. So it's a different color if it's a congenital Horner's. Uh, and then acquired causes you can split up into loads of different things. So where problems in which part of the body can cause a Horner syndrome? There's three main locations anatomically where you can get a Horner syndrome. So brainstem so you can get a central lesion a central nervous system lesion you can get the neck um which actually splits into two different cause uh, two different places if you look at the functional arrangement of the nerves so this is the easiest way to split it up this is the way most people remember it and the way passman teaches it actually um so you you have issues with the central nervous system issues before the ganglions or, or issues after the ganglions. Uh, the congenital sign was heterochromia. You have different colored eyes mm -hmm. on either side. Um, and An important, important point I just wanted to add here, a quick way of remembering this is just STC. Um, so S, stroke syringomyelia multiple sclerosis, right, gives you a couple of the causes, a couple of the major causes for the central lesions, right, T, you get pancos tumors at the apex of the lungs, you get thyroidectomy, you get trauma, right, causing the preganglionic uh, lesion, and C, so carotid, carotid pathology, cluster headaches, and cavernous sinus thrombosis causing the postganglionic ones. So that's just a, a, a cool way I have of remembering yeah, it. Yeah, that's a really me. useful way to remember it, actually. Um, so uh, splitting up like this is useful because it also splits up clinically. 
if you've got an issue with your central nervous system, you tend to get like this widespread anhydrosis all over your body. If it's only on the face that you, you get like, you would be concerned about pathologies before the ganglions. Is there any way to test for anhydrosis? Um, it's like an observation thing more than anything. I don't think there's like a specific test. I'm not really sure actually. Yeah. Um, and if it's after the ganglion, they don't have any anhydrosis. So yeah, just because there's no anhydrosis doesn't mean it's not Horner's. So don't, don't, don't fall into that illusion. Fine. And I've got a short, uh, tiny case here with lots of clues. I'm not going to read it out. The, the two major ways it says of testing anhydrosis, uh, anhydrosis are making them sweat and checking, essentially, which is dumb, or a skin biopsy, which is way too invasive. So no. <laughs> yeah. That I believe is the answer. So what do you think about this case? This is a pretty rogue case, but I was like, this is the only way I can think about putting some mod B into here. So does anyone know what the diagnosis is? It's another niche condition that you need to know maybe four lines about. So, so the, the presentation is cavernous sinus thrombosis. That's not the underlying diagnosis, it, but yeah, it, it, it is cavernous sinus thrombosis. Um, and it has been caused by Bechet syndrome that I'll talk about very, very briefly. Um, so can you tell me why this is cavernous sinus thrombosis? Like, what has made you think about that? Yeah, so the mm -hmm. first the first sign you will get in cavernous sinus thrombosis is loss of the sixth cranial nerve, which means you won't be able to abduct the eye on that side. Okay, and yeah, alongside that classic presentation, dull, he constant headache with nausea mm -hmm. and vomiting. Um, so you've jumped to... Bechet's, and the reason you probably jumped to that, as you said, was because you get these pustules every time you get like a cut on your skin, and that's the test for that disease. What else in this history or in the context? Here's a weird pub quiz question. What about this <laughs> patient suggests that it might be Bechet's? This requires you to know where this name comes from. That's the answer. Yeah, it's a it's, it's it's a Turkish name. So any anyone from a Turkish or Mediterranean background, it massively increases their chance of having Bechet syndrome. Um, so this is all you need to know about it. It's an HLA B fifty one associated variable. It's like a vasculitis. It's one of it's a silk root disease. So um, people pretty much bred along the silk route or the travelers, and they have an increased risk of these autoimmune diseases. So that's Mediterranean populations. Uh, Turkish populations mainly. Um, classic features, deep vein thrombosis, genital ulcers, oral ulcers, and the sign you should be looking for on examination of their skin is erythema nodosum, but spelt correctly. Pathogy test, and you can manage it using immunosuppression. You might give them some heparin to prevent them from clotting, uh, and you can also use colchicine. Why do you get pustules on cannulation? that you definitely don't need to know that. Um, I don't know exactly, to be honest. James, do you know why? This is the kind of stuff that you might randomly know. No, he doesn't. I don't either. Me and James don't know. You, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Specifically, the sterile pustules. So if you cultured whatever came out of those pustules, it would be clean. So, so like, that's the specific learning point. Can you repeat the management? You don't really need to know the management, but yeah, you can give them heparin because they are at an increased likelihood of forming clots. Um, you can give them colchicine, which improves the condition by a mechanism I don't fully understand. I mean, colchicine is anti-inflammatory, so it's probably by that mechanism. Um, and that's about it. 
you can give them creams for ulcers and stuff like that. You don't really need to know the management. Super quick, how, how are you going to talk about um, uh, one is more partial ptosis versus full ptosis? I'm not. I wasn't planning to. Do you mind if I yeah, go jump in there quickly? A couple of lines. Um, uh, important part about Horner's and uh, something that helps differentiate it from other neurological causes of ptosis is that in Horner's you get a partial ptosis uh, as opposed to full ptosis you can get in other causes. The reason being um, Horner's usually uh, in, uh, kind of messes with the sympathetic supply right to that face, to that side of the face uh, from the sympathetic chain going upwards. And the only, so your eyelid is supplied by two muscles. So there's the levator palpebrae, um, which is kind of the major one. It does the heavy lifting. And the other one is uh, superior tarsal muscle or Muller's muscle. And that only has sympathetic supply and it only partially lifts the eyelid. So when you get corners knocked out sympathetic supply, that muscle gets uh, paralyzed, but le levator um, uh, still acts as is there's, is there's only a, a partial ptosis because it's it only controls part of the eyelid lift essentially. Um, so that was that was just a little little uh, little side side point. Continue, please. Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, we will stick around like for five minutes or so. I can I get you to just fill out this feedback form so we know what to change. Um, I'm quite interested to know whether you prefer like the longer cases that like some of our friends have been doing or whether you prefer the shorter cases that uh, Anka and I kind of prefer doing. Like that's like if, if you could specifically comment on that, that would actually be really useful. I mean, to be fair, I feel like the cases I did ended up being a little long anyway. I, I, I put in some other stuff as well that's just helpful to know yeah. around that area. But like this, the Bechette's, Bechette, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and uh, Horner's was uh was, was pretty straightforward. So yeah, you know, whichever one you prefer, yeah, more, more likely.